1978, Lucasfilm made a huge mistake. They prefer we all forget the Star Wars Holiday Special. Lucasfilm is still saying Mark Wish would talk about it. Uh, nobody is allowed to mention this. No, you don't remember it? It is so bad, it's not good. You have to see the Star Wars Holiday Special to believe it. The Emperor said we can't show the special in this trailer. But rest assured, you will see all the clips you can handle in the documentary film, A Disturbance in the Force. The Star Wars holiday special is sort of like the holy grail. I wanted to see this more than I wanted to live. We're starving as fans for anything Star Wars. So funny and so stupid at the same time. We have seen something that we weren't supposed to see. How did this happen? To find answers, we travel back and experience the insanity of 1970s variety television. When 70s TV was bad, there was no description for it. How in the world is George Lucas allowing this to happen? You intergalactic fool. Think you know about the Star Wars holiday special? You don't. A disturbance in the force. A story 45 years in the making. This is a, this is proof right here, guys. You're watching yeah. this. You will not meet nicer people. Oh, I'm at the point. Oh. <laughs> there and there. I, you will not meet nicer people. It coming back to a show that I dearly love and admire. So thanks for having me. It's like, that's Big Starklighter's helmet. So how did you know? Because <laughs> I'm a nerd. I've placed information vital to the survival of the rebellion into the memory systems of this <laughs> two unit. But, you know, I mean, I was doing my research and Wedge was obviously a character that you had to use. But if you were going to do Rogue Squadrons. What are you but, doing, C-3PO? I'm taking one last look at my <laughs> friends. These aren't your friends. Cassie and Jim on the beach, and people are like, no. You can, I can literally hear people that are like, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> they, it doesn't look like they're that even hungry when they get out. They're not just like, did you bring a, a Snickers yeah. or something? <laughs> <laughs> There's no logic to it. And then later, when we haven't even talked about the Wilford Grimley of it all. The same thing. Sears yeah. never left me again. We're such soulmates that her being older and me being older was exactly where we were both were meant to be. Because Darth Vader was the scariest thing that had ever happened to anybody. And this guy literally looks like the devil. You? Or do not. There is no try. <laughs> What's the big question people have? Like, what's the thing everybody's wondering about? What's the thing I don't understand? What would I want to hear? The galaxy isn't growing to push people out. It's growing to let more people come in and find their love so that it's able to continue and create this connected tissue. It's good to know that people still love it out there and that the people who made it are all proud and passionate about it and willing to come back. It was a mess, dude. I had to wear a patch for a bit. We went to see Star Wars that night because I said, no, I'm going. We have to go. And I went to see Star Wars with a fucking huge thing on my eye. <laughs> I, I like yeah. to denote people as daddies from time to time. Um, okay. And I believe that you are a certified daddy. Like Pedro Pascal is a daddy. Like, right. you know, yeah, certified daddy. I have had the best time ever on Around the Galaxy. Thank you so much. We are live on a Monday night hanging out with Jeremy Kuhn, Adam F. Goldberg, Kyle Newman, the creators of a phenomenal uh, uh, documentary, a must-see for Star Wars fans called A Disturbance in the Force. It is the it's it's the love letter to the most infamous thing ever to come out of Star Wars. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing? Doing great. Good, thank you. Excellent. I, I'm great. We're, we're excited to talk about this 
monstrosity that's been misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited uh, to have you guys here. We have Adam F. Goldberg, who's, of course, famous for the Goldbergs television show, which ran on ABC for 10 years. I was telling Adam before we started, I consider myself sort of equal parts Barry and Adam, but unfortunately a little bit closer to Johnny Atkins than I might want to admit. And, of course, uh, Jeremy Kuhn, who uh, also uh, is known as the producer of Napoleon Dynamite, which kind of is a it's kind of a bridge movie between Gen X and Millennials. I'm starting to kind of see it that way and and probably the most quoted movie in my house other than uh, the original trilogies and of course um kyle newman who directed fanboys and one up um and a couple of taylor swift videos did i i, I didn't even realize that kyle when, when did... a recent one just came out uh, for clean which was taylor's um taylor's version of clean from her redo of 1989 Okay. So there's that video came out like two weeks ago. I'm going to tell my daughter that. And then suddenly she'll be more respectful of daddy's weird little <laughs> podcast. <laughs> but so, um, so, you know, I showed the trailer at the top, but maybe uh, tell us a little bit about disturbances in the force and, and, and what it's about uh, a disturbance in the force. And, uh, and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of lead you into a couple of the questions I have for you, but may, who wants to take the lead on that one? Go for it. Kyle. Kyle. Yeah, Kyle's but Kyle's more eloquent than I am. <laughs> no, I mean, look, we we all wear different hats in this. I, I'm happy to tell my version. I'm sure Jeremy would have his own, and Adam would have his own. We brought a lot of personal experience to, too, because we all. This is something that was. It's been in the mythology of Star Wars. We've all heard about for so long. We've all been curious about. We've all wanted to know how and why it happened. And as the subtitle, you know, of the film, the title of the film poses the question: like, really, how in the heck did this happen? Um, mm -hmm. It's it's legend, but it's also something that could be decoded by sitting down with all these great people. So Steve Kozak and Jeremy are co-directors. Um, they set out on this quest, and, and I joined, and Adam joined to help them see it through, and that that was our role in it. It the, They wanted to get to the bottom of how this thing came together, and it's a very unique point in Lucasfilm history, this point between Star Wars when it burst onto the scene. It was a phenomenon. It captured the zeitgeist. And 1980 when Empire came out. And it really solidified the identity of the brand. And then you have this special, which happens right in the middle of the two, mm. as George is, is founding Lucasfilm and moving it north as he's putting all his own money into this next big venture. So this thing happens um, on his watch, partially. And what we get to do with this documentary is sit down with the directors, the writers, the liaisons, reps from Lucasfilm, 20th Century Fox, costumers, actors, everybody that's a part of this thing, plus archival footage, to really get to the bottom of, A, how it came together, and B, what was 70s television like? What was mm -hmm. going on in the zeitgeist? Star Wars did not invent the variety show. It was merely plugged into it. So it kind of separates some of this stuff so you can get to the bottom of the the era and how much of it, like who's really at fault based on based on... <laughs> what star wars was plugged into because like i said this wasn't star wars's invention it just capitalized on it as a way to keep the film relevant and so it's a very fun and insightful look at this strange period in lucasfilm's history which seemingly no one wants to talk about well i mean it clearly comes from first of all in order to go and go on this journey you have to be a star wars fan uh not to watch the movie but to do what you guys did let me just ask you i'll start with you jeremy when did you become a Star Wars fan? What are your kind of earliest memories of, of Star Wars? Yeah, so I was born a year after the special came out, so I have no memory of it airing, obviously. But I've, I don't, I've, I've been a Star Wars fan since I could remember. My brothers are 9 and 10 years older than me, and those are the first toys I played with. The first movie I recall seeing in the theater was Return of the Jedi. Mm. Uh, so I don't have any memories of not Star Wars not existing. Uh, but for the special, I didn't know. I, I got a bootleg in like 2002 uh, and I watched it and I made it 20 minutes and I'm just like, this isn't real. Like, this has got to be a joke or something. And I, I didn't, I, over the years it's built up. That was my first introduction to the holiday special. Mm -hmm. and, and Adam, when did you first see Star Wars and and, and how did it? Uh... My, my, I think my earliest like movie memory is waiting in line for Empire. Mm. Um, so, and cause I think I remember just cause the line was so long, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so obviously since that moment hooked, um, and I, I went to college with Kyle 
Uh, this was the mid nineties, not to make us seem too old, but it was the mid nineties. And I think, you know, at that point, like everyone was obsessed with like Pulp Fiction uh, and Kyle and I were the only ones that were, was like Star Wars. We like, we love Star Wars. That's kind of <laughs> how we bonded. So, um, I mean, think about it at that time in 95, you know, there was the mo- the original movies and I think the, the special editions coming out soon after. And, and uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's how Kyle and I bonded. So um, uh, yeah, that's, it's just been, you know, just lifelong fan. And, and I first heard about the special in like elementary school. And I remember like being told that it was like an actual like movie. Like, you know, there's this holiday movie that it's, that no one ever has ever seen. <laughs> so it was just like the thing of legend. I didn't like, I was told it wasn't a variety show, but it was an actual movie. Oh. So um, I, I didn't even really see it until it was on the internet, I believe, um, when, once it started leaking onto the internet. Maybe in college, I, I think someone had a copy in college as well on VHS, but um, yeah, it, I, I didn't see it during my childhood either. Um, it was just like so, like a legendary thing that was kind of like told on the playground. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, Weird Al even mentions, I think, in the documentary, I was like a currency among among the fandom. Kyle, when did you first see the the special and, and what do you remember about it? So, okay, so special, I think we went, I was really little. First time I saw Star Wars was my first memory. It was like a drive-in, and I, I I barely remembered the movie, but I remembered some of it. And from that point on, I, I could just name Star Wars characters before I could name brothers and sisters and normal <laughs> Earth words. I became obsessed. And I remember there's this, so there's a special. I think we were going to my uncle's or something, and I was really upset because we wanted to watch it. My brothers were upset. Um, again, I don't remember much. I think maybe we caught some of it there and then I was right. We were hurrying home to watch it. Maybe I got on the TV for a little bit and then I passed out, but I remember it was like weird and I didn't like it. It was like 10, I was a little, little. and then, um, but I never thought much about it. And then you'd see it pop up in like star log and, and different mentions. There was a Tomart's guide that had some Wookiee action figures. And I, I, uh, there was all this stuff surrounding it that I wanted to know more about. And I think I went to a, a convention, New York Comic Con, maybe 90, 1992. I went to go see Jim Lee, like when X-Men came out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I'll just go by the Star Trek booth. And um, I was like, hey, wh- what do you got? He had a couple Star Wars things. He's like, oh, Star Wars crap. You know, it was like <laughs> the inverse of the scene in Fanboys. And he pulled up this like crummy box. And it was like where they relegated the Star Wars stuff. Because you have to remember, in 19, early 90s, Star Wars was dead. Yep. It was probably just going to end up being a cult film. No one cared. We all think it was like, yeah, it was a phenomenon when it happened. But unless George, like, if he didn't put that time in to, like, resuscitate the brand and put out special editions and nourish it, it wouldn't have happened. The publishing help, Dark Horse, all the stuff coming out from, um, you know, the Heir to the Empire, everything. So this guy just kept the, a, a, a tape of the holiday special underneath his table for <laughs> losers that like Star Wars. And it was like $30. And I bought that. And then a few years later, I was at the Jersey Shore and some guy had all these bootlegs. And I was like, oh, do you have a holiday special? And he had one. He's like, oh, this is the best one ever. You know, hmm. everyone claimed that the best one ever. And his was right. like $40, only cash. <laughs> you know, I was like trying to collect different copies of them. But um, they all suck. They all, all the quality was terrible. Um, so I, I just, you know, it's one of those things. Then once it came out on the internet, once you could get it on CD, our friend Ernie Klein brought the CD when we were mm. mixing fanboys up. And he was like, oh, here's all these old commercials in the holiday special. And we played that for George Lucas's kids. And they were like, what? <laughs> was that made a holiday special? What? No, this isn't real. Like George didn't even tell his kids about it? No. Oh. <laughs> they had no idea. And they were like adults in late teens. <laughs> What it what else is Eric not telling us? <laughs> it was hard, very like it was something that was not talked about, I guess, in the Lucas house. <laughs> oh my gosh. You bring up an interesting com- comment too, and uh I'd love all your perspective on it. You know, you mentioned like it was this time where when it came out, uh I always say like the Empire Strikes Back is the most important Star Wars movie, more so than Star Wars because it started to build the lore. But that's one of the things that struck me most about um the special uh, or uh, and and more importantly from watching the uh the documentary is this realization that today we're 45 years i mean the the special came out 45 years ago this friday coming up which is remarkable but we are almost 50 years old for star wars and it just feels like there's so much stuff that you can and can't do and the, the rules are pretty clear 
But at that time, there was there was all we had was the original film. This was almost Star Wars 1.5. Talk to me a little bit about what you found out and what your your own personal perspective on about how a movie like this is even made. Knowing what we know today, it's obviously you look back, things are a little bit differently, but knowing what we know today, talk a little bit about, about your perspective on that from there. Well, George, George had like things written that he gave to the writers of like, here's some like stuff that he wanted to be canon. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I think, and that's the, that's the stuff in the doc that I love the most. Cause you like, you kind of see where he was going with certain things. And, and uh, one of the things that we, talk about in the doc is that um that han solo was married to a wookie that was like <laughs> one of the things that he wanted to kind of like initially kind of present with this special so yeah he george was still kind of like baking it all up in his brain and like it's fun it's fun like yeah the other thing about this special is it's the premiere of boba fett like right. um so so that's like you know there's there is stuff that stuck around and then there's stuff that was completely abandoned. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's so early in the, in the star Wars kind of universe that um, George was just kind of like testing stuff out almost. And, and uh, that, that was like initially when he was involved, you could definitely see there was a lot of testing going on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Jeremy, what's, when you think about, um, about what was going on at that time, and and what's some of the more surprising things you you learned while you were, or the things that struck you while you were putting the documentary together? I, I mean, for me, I, I didn't realize how bad variety TV was at the time. Like, I knew I've heard stories <laughs> about it, but when you actually start digging in and watching stuff, like that Donnie Marie special, I had never heard of, and like watching that, and it's I mean, it's way worse than the holiday special, and way more embarrassing, I think. <laughs> Uh, so just kind of living in that world and waiting in it was, uh, I couldn't get enough of it. We tried to put as much as we could at the docks. It was just, it was, I mean, it was just what passed for T primetime television was crazy. And I've, I've, yeah. I have this feeling like 50 years from now, people are going to look at it and be look at what we're watching today and maybe feel the same way. It's just, I mean, to me, I, I kind of view the special as like, it's like Star Wars high school yearbook. Like no one's cool in high school, especially 35, 45 years removed. So it's kind of like you just need to own it and not be embarrassed and pretend like it didn't. You can be embarrassed and laugh, but you can't pretend like it didn't happen. <laughs> right. Kyle, how about yourself? You know, it's look, I love the way like Adam handles it in in Goldberg's. I remember that episode. We got to put that in here and the discovery, and there's <sighs> Like the context is everything, and we have a, we have the, one of the, if not the last interview, I think, with J.W. Winsler, who's this great um, historian and author who wrote Making of Star Wars and Empire and even Indiana Jones. A uh, very insightful guy because he really got to live and breathe Lucasfilm up there and spent a lot of time with George. And and you know, the way he frames it and the way he looks at it was, was very eye opening, insightful, and talking about context being everything for art. And I think that's what this documentary tries to do is put it in the right framework so you can, we can look on it this many years later, look back at it in the proper way. It's easy to just poke fun at something and pile on. Um, So I think that is so vital to understanding it. And look, if you look at so many things have their, their, their time in the sun, even like you wait 20 years in single, like multi-camera television with laugh tracks and stuff. I've seen like teenagers be like, they made, they put laughing in and like, it's strange to people. Like um, the way culture evolves, the way storytelling evolves and film is such a new medium. Television was like a pretty new medium too at the time. And they were still trying to figure out how to, how to make this all work and how to harness it. Look, we own studios. We're putting out movies. We have shows. It's really split. Like T film people don't go on the TV. It's not like now where you see actors from film going on television. There were different rules. You right. know, those rules and those contexts were essential, I think, to um, analyzing this and presenting it. I think that's that was like the most eye-opening stuff and really stopping and pausing and thinking about it in that way. How did you, uh, Adam, how did you go about creating this so that it didn't feel like poking fun at it uh because clearly when you when people get a chance to see it and by the way check disturbance in the force.com because you guys are are running screenings around the country over the next couple of weeks and in, in different areas some of them with q a's the new and, ones and, were just added 
are going to be added. So please check the site tomorrow. I think yep. there's there's um, oh, fantastic some new ones coming. Jeremy's going to be updating. Yeah, and if you're in Australia, or UK, there's more coming too. So there's oh, fantastic. That's great. That is great. Um, as you you know, I, I've been very fortunate to have had a chance to see it. Um, and it is done from a, a place, it feels like it's done from a place of love. Adam, how did you approach this so that it didn't feel like, you know, it, it's easy to laugh at the, 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 the holiday special. We all have laughed at it. But how did you approach it? Well, I think... Um... I think we go harder at like, like what Jeremy said, like at the variety shows than we do the special mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's giving a lot of context of like what was around at the time. And look, we're all, everyone in who made this movie, we're all huge Star Wars fans and mm -hmm. we're not like setting out to make an expose of some, you know, uh, like bashing George about some thing that he was or wasn't involved with. We just wanted to really explain to people like this thing exists um, and here's how it happened. And then we also interview other fans like us who love Star Wars, good and bad. So there's things right. you could take away from this that are awesome. And um, you can love it as a little time capsule. You can appreciate it with all its flaws. Um, so that's really what we were going for. It was, especially because I think if we made something really nasty and mean spirited, I don't even know that Lucasfilm would let us do that. I think, yeah. I think if they really, felt like we were taking shots at, at George and, and, and the movies. I don't, I don't know that I think they probably try and shut it down. Um, yeah. So, you know, but again, this is made by people who love Star Wars. And so we just, we wanted to like, you know, I, I would say it's more of a love letter to that era than it, than it is like a, a takedown of like, you know, a, a money grab or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's. I think that's why it comes across as like that. It's made with love, just because that's we love Star Wars. I think to add to that, you know, what Jeremy and Steve did. There's a lot of just raw inquisitiveness, um, stripped away all those preconceptions about it, and kind of built it up from the from the bottom. And just said, let's talk to the people who made it. Let's find what it was like to be on set. Let's hear what it was like to be in the room developing it. Let's hear what it was like to be in the chaos of post production on it. Hmm. Don't go in with an agenda. We don't need to character assassinate this thing. There's a lot of love. And I think people that, that were interviewed felt safe. They felt like, you know, it's, I'm, how many years removed? I'm going to go tell the truth. You know, I worked for 20 hours this day. The footage looked like crap or, you know, people felt good about things too. So it's like getting all those real honest moments, like even Pete Sears was like, hey man, I'm, I'm, I trust these people. They made Star Wars. I'm rolling up on the set and they're telling me to dress myself. Okay, I'll pick out some cool stuff. And I think... Because of the, the tone that was that was established and the, the approach that they took to documenting it, people give very genuine things. And, and the there's not a mean bone in the film's body. It really is just very straightforward and honest. It's not pretentious like a lot of documentaries. It's not trying to reinvent the documentary. It's mm -hmm. saying, let's go look at this thing in a fun, straightforward way. And I think that's what people, fans, and that have seen at festivals and critics have, have responded to, thankfully. It's that that just an honest approach. Yep. Yeah. And I I, th I think that definitely comes through again. I think that's that's the biggest challenge with something like this because you know, as you know, somebody who does a Star Wars podcast that I've been doing for four years, it's always the thing we joke about. It's always the, you know, when uh, I used to ask people what their least favorite Star Wars was, which just a negative question. And damn it, I'm glad I stopped asking that because that's just rude and toxic and not good. But we, it was always the holiday special. It was always the holiday special. But it was interesting because we just, um, we just I've got were, one more, but I won't say it. <laughs> I, know, I know which one you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know what i i have one too and i'll bet you we're we may be in the same trilogy anyway um so the, um but it, it's interesting because it's 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 hated and it's loved at the same time um i, I mean i i'll share i ended up with my copy of the uh the Star Wars Holiday Special directly from Steve Sansweet, who's also in your film. Um, my parents years ago, my father years ago, um, and a bunch of his friends created a science fiction and horror trivia game. It was a board game just as the time then board games were going out of style. So it was just a just missed. But Steve said, I will trade you a copy of the Star Wars Holiday Special for a copy of your father's game. And so we made that trade. And um, 
but it was so funny because the label on it was the Star Wars not so holiday special, Spe- holiday not so special, which I thought was yeah. kind of funny coming coming from Steve. What were some of your favorite? Uh, I'll start with you, Jeremy. What were some of your favorite uh, interviews uh, that you had? I think one of the things that's so great about it is you have captured, you know, uh, uh, Rinsler and some other people who are no longer with us. But Jeremy, who were some of your favorite interviews that we'll see in the film? And my favorite, so like, I mean, having Kyle and Adam on as like producers was like a huge help. So I was like, hey, I would like to talk to Kevin Smith. And Adam's like, hey, I know I know him. And, you know, <laughs> Kyle knew Seth Green. Like, those are my top two. Like, Seth Green, I feel, is the next best to interviewing Lucas himself. Mm. Like, he's a perfect person to be talked to this. And, like, I feel we're very lucky that he was open and willing to talk to us. And Kevin was just like a dream to talk to. Like, he was just... Yeah, we were kind of going through the Rolodex. Aside from people who worked on it, we're like, who would I want to watch the special with and get their opinion? And so, like, yeah, th- those are my top two, just because I'm fans of theirs and they fit within the story really well. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I I, I don't think a lot of people realize, and we only knew because we had Seth on our uh, charity podcast last year um on our uh, friends of our show uh bomb cast but you don't realize a lot of people don't realize just like how closely seth green worked with george during detours and during even robot chicken Crazy. his Crazy. insight is yeah. is insane it's great what about you adam who was some of your favorite uh, um episodes? i think mine's bruce valanche like uh he was a writer on the special as a comedy writer he, he's just like a legend um I mostly know him as the center square from, <laughs> that's right uh, <laughs> You know Hollywood Squares, but no, I mean, um, it's 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 great to have a a real comic voice um, as someone that was actually there who could speak to kind of how absurd things were getting and over budget and misguided. Um, we did a panel with him. I was it was cool to meet him, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, it's I think that's my favorite is that there is a com- there is a legendary comedy writer on that writing staff. It's pretty amazing. So. He's my favorite, I think, in the uh, in the whole thing. It is, and I think that's one of the other surprises. I mean, there were billions of surprises in the in the in the time I watched it, but to to recognize that it, Bruce Valanche was there, uh, Bob Mackie, these legends in Hollywood yeah. from the seventies and eighties and before, uh, even before, right? Because you had uh, uh, Harvey Corman and B. Arthur, so you had these people who'd been around forever who were put into this and and a big part of it. Kyle, what about you? Who was your favorite interview? You know, it's a bit. I love all the archival stuff that that uh, Jeremy and Steve were able to uncover and seeing people in their moment back in the day talk about this thing, promote this thing. Like Anthony Daniels, there's this weird clip early on, and he's like talking about how he's in town and and he's doing this thing, and he tells it with a straight face. He has no idea what this is about to become. I love <laughs> stuff like that. The modern interviews. I I mean. I could listen to J.W. Rensler talk about Star Wars. Yeah all day he brings like a certain authority and calmness with his voice it's also you know tragic and uh i think we're appreciative that this is his last interview and he was passionate about speaking so i think that there's numerous reasons why that's probably the most special and i think he really is um he's acute in his analysis he really like cuts right to the the heart of what was going on there inside lucasfilm and also externally culturally um I think it gives the movie some real like uh, lifeblood. So mm-hmm. I would say that. I mean, obviously, seeing a lot of these other these these guys who I love and respect so much, you know, from Seth to Patton and Paul Shear and weird, all these people talking about this too, and realizing you know they all had this experience with it, and we all spoke the same language. I think that that's pretty profound too. Yeah. What is it you think about? It is, it is about Star Wars, and you guys are now, you've gone from being fans as kids to now being in the industry. What is it about Star Wars that, even though for all intents and purposes, first of all, for all intents and purposes, Star Wars never should have looked as good as it did. I remember reading an article with Ralph McQuarrie saying, uh, you know, George, these things look great, but they're never going to work on screen. And yet everything about Star Wars in the original films actually ended up working. But what is it about Star Wars that, I mean, it's for it's going to be 50 years old uh in just a couple of years um why is it still why is why does it still have the the staying power uh that that no other i, I dare say no other film uh, series has jeremy where do you i'll start with you uh i guess for me 
part of it's just like the age you were when it came out. So like, but it was also something I remember enjoying with my entire family. My parents enjoyed it. My older brothers enjoyed it. And like, it wasn't like, now I'm going to slum it and go see like an animated movie with like my kid, like, you know, a six year old. I'm not going to enjoy it as well. So it was like, we all were excited to go see that. And there was that excitement that like my mom actually enjoyed the toys more than I think my brothers, because she would buy it and she was excited to use this as an excuse to buy stuff. So, I mean, I was a spoiled kid where I just had like every Star Wars toy, but I just remember that just the whole family event. And I think it's, it's universal across cultures where people, that's what it's tapping into is whatever that magic is. Mm. So it's really hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear you say to mention family. I think most of the people that I've had on the show over the last four years, when I talk about those early Star Wars thoughts, the first thought goes to, you know, my dad took me, my mom took me, my, you know, my brother introduced me to it. It's got that family vibe. And, and I guess the fact that it's still around now, Adam, you have any thoughts on that? I think for me, it's like, Hey, special <laughs> guest. <Hey. laughs> I think for me, it's, um, you know, one of those movies, like, there's only a handful of them where your mind is just blown. Um, mm -hmm. And people in general are just kind of jaded and feel like they've seen it all. And then you go and you're, you go to a movie and you're just like knocked on your ass. Right. Yeah. So for me, that was, that's star Wars. For me, that's the matrix, mm -hmm. um, the Borat movie. There's like a couple <laughs> I could point to where I'm like, this is changing the way I'm looking at the world. Right. Um, and I think, you know, Star Wars has that, but it's also story wise, just a, your classic underdog story. Um, yeah. Like it's like the perfect, you know, obviously inspired by Campbell, like it's the perfect story that, you know, um, uh, so it has both of those things going for it. Like I think in the Matrix, the story itself didn't really kind of match up to what Star Wars presented to me story-wise, mm -hmm. but visually it was just on the next level. So I think Star Wars hit both of those things. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to be blown away. And, and Star Wars for me, at least that that's one of those movies. Well, Adam, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody tells you, you know, the the Goldbergs. That was my childhood. That was my, I, I, you know, the Flyers hat, Star Wars, Rush, <laughs> Philadelphia area. Like I, I watch that, and I'm like, this, this is. I use that to show my kids. This is what I grew up with, <laughs> and it's. Um, but it's interesting that you say the Matrix as well, because I felt very similar to the Matrix in that, similar to Star Wars, the Matrix. You could watch it at that top level is just a cool, fun action movie. But there's lore behind it. There's, you know, classic myth going on. There's uh, uh, religious overtones and, and things. And it just works on on multiple levels, which I think is is a big Star Wars thing. Yeah, it's it's hard with sci-fi. Like another one that pops into my mind was like Gar the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. Like, the, you know, these are just movies that for me, I was like this, like I, I, I want to live in this universe. Um, so, yeah, there's it's. Um, I think especially with sci-fi, right? You're presenting just like a, a different kind of reality that people are existing in. So um, yeah, it's uh, that's why these movies are like really special. But then, you know, there's always for me, especially like a comedy, like I said, Borat, like mm -hmm. there's certain comedies that just also take me by surprise in the same kind of way. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, that's... I, I think you'd like a, a movie called Napoleon Dynamite. It's really, it's a, it's a classic comedy. <laughs> that well. was one for me too. I, I saw that at Sundance. I saw it like every screening possible. I went back to Los Angeles. Like there's a movie coming. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? What are you quoting? And for like the next year, then I was vindicated. Everyone came out. I was like, oh my God, you're right. And I, my friend and I, we watched, we, we saw every screening. We were just like, yeah, you got to see this movie. Uh, Etienne has a message for everybody. What's your oh. message? I heard it. <laughs> um, yeah, for, for me, why Star Wars has the staying power, it's, yeah, it's an amalgamation of what everybody just said. It's the spiritual core. It's the greatest hero's journey ever told on film. I mean, everyone's tried to do this and they just can't. Those That three film arc is unparalleled yeah. in cinema. Uh, you just can't name a better hero's journey. And that's that's the core. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the other thing it's it's also it's also this myriad of all these great 
films, all these great influences that George like absorbed into his body and then put yeah. back out into the world, samurai films, Westerns. Um, it's, it's pulp. It's yeah. screwball comedy at its height. Like Empire Strikes Back is a screwball comedy. It's like it happened one night in space. <laughs> um, there's a brilliance to that. And there's a purity too. And on top of just being that, it also broke all this ground in terms of special effects and technology and innovation. And Star Wars used to be the gold standard. It was synonymous with technical, technological innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, right now it's just like, okay, here's another one. It's like everything else. But it, it wouldn't, he wouldn't release a movie until it blew your mind. And I think all mm -hmm. of those things are taken for granted or forgotten. And when you add that all together and you're like, oh, this was three films and he financed them himself. They're basically independent movies. Yeah. You don't have to take notes from any of these jerks. You're like, this is incredible. You know, yeah. and that's that's what's astounding about it. And that's why I even respect the, the prequels and what he did. He's like, I'm not listening to anybody. Um, it's like true independent independent cinema. He just wanted to tell stories in this huge science fiction fantasy playground. He made up his own rules. So I, it's it's pretty brilliant, and that's why we're still talking about it today. And I think we, you almost can. I don't think we're going to ever escape the conversation of Star Wars when it comes to film analysis. You know, there's like Adam started with the movies that affect you. It was like 2001. I didn't even mm -hmm. think it's like a film. That's like the eighth wonder of the world to me. That's like <laughs> Star Wars is changed my life. My life is literally fused with Star Wars. Like since my first memories, it's Star Wars onward. I don't remember anything else. So, yeah. um. I think that's all like, and it is this generation, you know, the us. And then the, hopefully the, the stuff that they put out into the world lives up to those standards. Yeah. And I just hope we don't keep lowering the bar and say, well, we got to make a lot of them. So let's just jam them all out, you know, and, and the editing. One thing I want to talk about is the editing of Star Wars. You know, George was able to take a lot of things that didn't work that Ralph McQuarrie and all these people thought, oh my God, this isn't working on set. Right. This is not working. But you have to take your time and massage the material, make the best out of what you're left with in the cutting room, as opposed to saying, well, this was on the page and I'm sticking to this and it's not working. And a lot of people do that. A lot of filmmakers are love their own words, especially writer directors. Mm -hmm. They're they're obsessed with them and they don't want to accept the fact that what what happened in the making of it is its own living, breathing thing that has to be taken care of in its own way. And I think he did that. He's he's the hardest person on Star Wars. I mean, he's he's like I think he said once. You know, I'm the only person that's never seen Star Wars because he <laughs> made it. You know, he lived it. Like he never got to sit in the theater and experience it fresh. Right. The only person in the world. Uh, so he's particularly hard on it. That's why we got special editions. And I'm sure he was, you know, as you understand from watching the doc, he tried to not let this be seen. Yeah. I'm sure he's I'm sure there's he he wants to say he's over it, but I'm I think it psychologically changed him as a person. Yeah. Well, I think I mean obviously you guys you you were closer to to it than than i i was i got to enjoy and and your 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 documentary myself and really enjoy it uh but it's interesting because everything you just said i think is a perspective that if you bring with you into watching this helps you understand why yes people joke and you know harrison ford says he doesn't want to talk about it and mark hamill says at the beginning that he was he's been told don't talk about it but george probably saw this as and, and you guys explore it in the film this is truly what george did not want to have happen to star wars right it became it went through the the meat grinder of entertainment and and was everything wrong with with it for uh, but uh, but again i think one of the interesting things too is and one of the great things and i i urge people to watch not only service in the force but if you get a chance to watch the holiday special and you you're willing to sit through it i mean some of the stuff that george and the 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 writers came up with that was so groundbreaking the 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 ipad concept the virtual reality concept the um just so many different things that that ended up in that movie um i i, I want to ask you guys it's been 45 years it'll be 45 years this friday when it, it debuted um why now? Why is now the right time to go back and, and look at this uh, this Star Wars insider joke, if you will, that's become, you know, it's it's part of the Star Wars culture. Why why now is the right time? Jerry, Jeremy, I'll start with you. I don't have the best answer for that. We started on this like four years ago, and I feel like every, every doc project I've started at, I just started with questions, mm -hmm. and we just kind of kept going through it. So it's kind of like, 
I mean, I was sh- I was shocked that no one had already done this before we started. I was like, there's got to be some other existing dive, and there's 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 like small vignettes and stuff on YouTube, but no one really does like a quality deep dive on it. Uh, I mean, for me, like we made a movie that it's kind of like a time capsule, like we said, but it's also just like a fun, lighthearted ride. And I feel we need more entertainment. that's kind of like looking back. It's kind of nice to revisit this more innocent time. Mm-hmm. There's some nostalgia for it. And I feel I found it kind of cathartic making it to, you know, just live in that world for a while where it was just a simpler time. And there's not any politics. There's not any, it's just, you take it for what it is and, and, and get to have a couple of, get to have a lot of laughs looking at it. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I think that's a, a really great way to look at it as well. Adam, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think something that's interesting is like with now Disney plus, um all the animated series there's a lot there's a lot of star wars content um Mm -hmm. out there and it's interesting to see how the content now is a lot of it is referencing the special because Hmm. um you know you have people like favreau filoni who are like you know super fans like like everyone on the zoom so Mm -hmm. (laughs) so um it's really interesting to see that uh, it even though it is this thing that George took his name off of and tried to bury that it like still survives in the actual Star Wars universe in its own way and and you know what we didn't really dig into is like because it's so recent is they're now releasing Life Day Chewbacca and if you go to 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 Disneyland they have you know holiday special merch. Mm-hmm. So it's it's in this we I think the why now is like it's in this weird kind of time for the first time Lucasfilm is kind of acknowledging it and um as well as like the filmmakers who are like making Star Wars are acknowledging it as well. So I think right. that's like that's what's changed in the last like couple years is that it's gone from this thing no one knows about to like here's like this forbidden thing we want to talk about and that's exactly <laughs> what we do. Yeah. Kyle, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think you're totally right. It's Star Wars is back on the small screen in a big way. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of Star Wars content and it is being referenced and the floodgates have opened. And I think that, did the Chewbacca action figure make it in, Jeremy? Yeah, thanks to Kyle. He had a friend that was at Comic-Con. I pushed for it, yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) He had a friend there. It was a last minute thing. Yeah, that last minute. I want this figure. I see that action figure. That Chewbacca life day figure came out last week. It was on Hasbro Pulse. It sold out in like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. You'll get at a theme park now. I'm furious. I want <laughs> this figure. It's like makes me so happy to see that this thing exists. It's on the original 12 back card. It's a thing of beauty. If you haven't seen it, Google Chewbacca Life Day Vintage Collection. You're, you're gonna lose your mind. The <laughs> fact that they allowed a figure to be made finally. I know they've done Boba Fett stuff and the faithful Wookiees on Disney Plus, but the fact that they did that shows that there's something changing. And mm-hmm. this thing, despite us trying to not talk about it and the community trying to, them trying to keep it down, the community is going to keep it alive. So it's a testament to that. So that's why now, now is the best time in the world to talk about. It. Yep. It's, uh, it's right as well. I mean, I think I, I remember the, 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 um, the Star Wars faithful on Twitter when the the photo of uh, the Mandalorian came out and he had the gun that Boba Fett had in a fa- in the faithful Wookiee. Yeah. People were just like, "That's the gun. That's the thing from yeah. from it." And then like, there's a there's a part in the in the dock where it's Favreau is sitting with George. I think they're shooting the Mandalorian, and George came to set to visit, and uh, Favreau is like. What do you think of that gun, huh, George? And George has no idea what he's talking about. He's like, I, I don't know. He's like, no, that's the gun from the holiday special. The and George is like, I don't, no, I don't, rec- I don't know what you're talking about. So, <laughs> so it's like obviously George, uh, he's moved on from the special, but uh, you know, all the fans, you know, still are intrigued. Do you know if if George has had a chance to screen your special, your documentary yet? Uh, I, I highly doubt it, but, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually like, part of me is still, I don't know, disappointed or, or hold still holds out hope that like Lucasfilm will come around and scoop this up and put it on Disney plus as another thing to go with all their other star Wars content, because they are releasing toys. They, they do have merchandise. Like they, you know, they made a, a Lego, uh, star Wars holiday special. Like they, they've come around. So I, it, 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 
I wish we could have gotten George to finally sit down and talk about it, even if it was a five minute interview. Um, it's like, like you said, 45 years have passed at a certain point. It's like, come on, like, yeah. you know, you let, let's, let's look back at all of your work and let's right. talk about this one too. Um, why not? Uh, so in fairness, he never rejected. We never asked. Right. <laughs> That's we never true. asked. That's true. So who knows? We also never asked because we didn't want him to shut us down, too. <laughs> so, so I do think he's at that re he's at that introspective place where I bet he's trying to he's contemplating his legacy, and he's thinking about things. You know, it, you're right. It we were walking a very fine line here because it's a small movie and it's independent, and um, and uh, but I do think we get to the heart of things. You know, despite not speaking to him, but you're right. It's like I think there's enough distance for everyone involved. You know, yeah, I mean, the surprise for me, I think if Lucas watched it, so the thing that's one of the biggest surprises to me is I got way more em empathy for Lucas's position than I would have expected. Mm. Like, it makes sense what he did. He's 33, is the, like the world's his oyster, and the studio was like, hey, the sequel's three years away. Can you do something to fill this gap? And any one of us would do the same thing back then. Like, it totally makes sense. So, I mean, the only, thing, the only thing I can fault him is I think he should own it a little bit more and not pretend like it's not there, like we don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if he saw the film, he liked the way that we portray him because he's not portrayed as a villain at all. Right, right. And I, I, to your point, and, and I, I'll say it again and again, I think one of the great things about this documentary is it is not just a love letter to uh, to the the, the fans, but it's also if you're a pop culture fan from the 70s and 80s, late 70s, early 80s, you have to watch this. I mean, to me, as as a 53 year old who grew up, you know, I was seven when Star Wars came out and I, I have very faint memories of seeing pieces of the, uh, the only thing that I remember watching it on television when it was on that first time was the animated piece. And I remember being irritated that I couldn't understand what was happening with the Wookiees. But it is it's a part of 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 star wars and 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 it's a part of of the people who are making it as well who are making star wars you mentioned favreau you mentioned um i mean it it's stuff that's coming up all all the time so this love letter to that time is is uh is what makes this thing so great it's not i, I said at the top i'll say it again it isn't there's no there's no negativity or toxicity to it it's just this great study of that time um I, something yeah. I, I love about this doc i mean you you mentioned like hey if you haven't seen the the holiday special you should go online and check it out i i actually recommend you don't do that i recommend <laughs> you you watch this doc instead because yeah. the thing with the special is like it's really bad like and it's it it's, hard, it's to hard to watch, it's hard to watch. It's hard. yeah right but what's what's amazing about it is conceptually it's a variety show right so let's look at it like like snl right like there's music acts there's little sketches that in concept all of the sketches are really, really interesting <laughs> that's right a little virtual <laughs> reality <laughs> porn. Right? there's like virtual reality <laughs> porn like they're all but you but watching them they go on too long they're boring right. they're it's it's hard it's awkwardly made um it's cheaply made so like so what we do is we break down all the different little sketches they did, and we kind of have people just commenting on how it was made, uh, what's funny about it, what's weird about it. So it's like the best way to honestly watch the holiday special is this doc, right. because you don't have to like sit through, you know, 10 minutes of Wookiees just grunting at each other because they, you know, <laughs> they should have put in subtitles, but they weren't allowed because they said people won't read subtitles in the late seventies. They thought that. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's the best way to watch the holiday special actually is this doc because you don't have to, it, it makes it entertain, it makes something kind of unwatchable, very entertaining. And, and you're right. You do capture enough of it. So you feel like you've seen the important part. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you know what the version, the, the segments you do see, the glimpses you get are the best you're ever going to see. It's better than any VHS or anything you've got on YouTube because Jeremy works some wizardry on it. He still has to send us a copy of that wizardry version. Um, oh, it looks better than any version I've ever ran seen. Ran through an upriser, so it like, it's awesome. Wow! Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> it, you, I would never tell someone to sit and watch 
two hours, unless you're going to fast forward right to the, to the Diane Carroll VR thing and just go check this out. And then they're like, what are you showing <laughs> me? Then, then go up and watch special. And that's the order I would say. They go to the Diane Carroll VR porn, blow their mind, put on your movie, watch this, then go watch the whole thing. People will pass out. They'll drink their eggnog, you know, they'll sleep by the fire. They'll have their hot, their hot cocoa kind of uh, coma. That's when you put that on the end of the night with the special. This is like the perfect holiday event. I think it, all members of the family will be satisfied. It'll satisfy more than any variety TV show ever did. You bring up, you just made me think about part of it is astonishing. First of all, that the Diane Carroll part got approved by censors in 1978. Um, second of all, none of the, as I'm thinking about this, none of the pieces go together. Like they don't, like a variety show flows, right? <laughs> and it's connected. The pieces just, they feel so very, like the, 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 the B. Arthur singing portion and the, they're just so weirdly jammed together. So yes, watching it through a disturbance in the force is the best way to, to see it. I changed what I said, Adam, you, you've changed my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I wish it was more like, <laughs> I wish it was more like the room, you know, where you watch it and you're just like, it's so bad. It's the greatest thing ever. It's more, it's more of like a bummer to watch it because it's like, it's so slow and awkward and, um, and you yeah. do have to fast forward. So that's why I, I love this doc so much. It's just because it gives such context and we have really funny comedians also talking about, you know, talking about, you know, why, why, just why do all of <laughs> just why. How and why. <laughs> right. Yep. Jeremy, did you want to say that thing? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've so the course of making this, I've watched the special six times, beginning to end, over the last four years, and every time it was a, it was a slog because I was just <laughs> I wanted to watch it in full context to see what I could pull out because I couldn't fast forward because I'm like there's certain lines I wanted to pull out that I could take out of context, and it, it, it was yeah, it, it was never I never enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's the most ringing endorsement, the most accurate endorsement of the Star Wars holiday special is I've never enjoyed it. I've yeah, watched it six times and I've never enjoyed it. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, so as we come down to, to the end of your time, first of all, thank you again for, for spending the time with us to talk about this. And, and again, visit disturbanceintheforce.com every day looking for it uh for the for where you can see this um as you you guys had said um you're not 100 percent sure yet on where distribution may be for this uh how can we what can fans do to say hey disney get this on there this i mean honestly it's not because you guys are sitting here in front of me it's it really it deserves to be on Disney plus in their star Wars section, because it's, it's a documentary that tells the story of something that they don't want people to watch. They don't want people to watch it. So I'll, I'll share some, some inside information here. I, um, we end our Friday night show live every week and we use the, um, the B Arthur song from the holiday special. We have not gotten copyright struck once. So Lucasfilm is like, no, you guys want to use it, have at it because no, we don't want anything about it, but how, how can, we make sure that people go and see this and and increase the chances of getting the the right pickup so more people can see it yeah we're, we're gonna make a big announcement on friday life day uh, oh, about more yes. of that so like you have the theaters uh we'll have a christmas present for people to be able to enjoy it at home at some point later this year and then i would love if disney came around tomorrow we could make something work so if people want to go pick it and call disney and inundate them <laughs> feel free uh it's actually more Lucasfilm. I think Disney would actually be interested. It's Lucasfilm that needs to be convinced. Mm. Uh, if you have a TV yeah. or a computer and a credit card, we are going to beam this into yeah. your brain harder than Diane Carroll got beamed. <laughs> <laughs> two boxes back. You are going to be able to mainline get you, this. Get your lumpy. It's your it? holiday experience. Yeah. <laughs> Very soon. From the comfort of your couch, from your living yeah. room, right where Chewbacca's dad <laughs> the VR port. I can't believe. I mean, he's right in the middle of the house, dude. It's just right out in the middle of the house. <laughs> Might as well have like done it in the kids' room. It's like, 
As I said, it's a simpler time. Stuff like that was okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah, his was... daughter's like over there. His, his daughter-in-law is just like cooking Wolfie burgers. And he's just like. <laughs> and rewinding <laughs> it over and over. Uh, he was reading the articles. He was reading it for the article. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the one interview. I, I wish we got in Diana, Diane Carroll's interview because she, she wouldn't agree to one. And then she passed away like a year later. But mm. I assume she had no idea it was on the other side of that. They're like, hey, shoot this and be sexy. She has no idea what's on the other side of the editing on that. <laughs> oh, man. So there's so much to see and enjoy with A Disturbance in the Force. And I can't wait for the announcement on Friday. If you get a chance to go and see it in any of these screenings, please do. Um, I'm looking to try to make it myself because um, they're going to be in the New York area for sure. Um where can we keep up with uh, information about uh, the film and keep up with each of you? Yeah, if you go to disturbanceintheforce.com, that's the best place. I'll update it every day. We get stuff. I'm actually in New York right now because we're playing Doc NYC as our final festival, uh, which will be the tomorrow. first time we show the final version of the movie. Yeah. What were you saying? That's tomorrow and Wednesday. And then if you're in London, yeah. Thursday is the UK premiere at the Prince Charles Cinema um there's screenings this week so depending on where you are in the world yeah. like go to the website find out there's probably seats spread the word bring a friend bring your grandpa <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like jeremy said um this is the very first time people have seen the festival cut which everyone responded really well to but they've been putting the finishing touches on this version which is it's got more it's a special specialer edition of, yeah. of it's got pad and it's got steve sand sweet uh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's and it's got, holes we wanted to. it's got the life day action figure, yeah. which I didn't even yep, know. It's in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I Kyle, I have to say, I I noticed the difference in the edit from from the one you gave us six months ago when we had you on the show, and uh, and it's it was great then, but it's so cohesive now, and so uh, it yeah. tells the story so well. I I enjoyed it even more the second time watching it. Excellent. Unlike unlike Jeremy watching the special itself six times i enjoyed it every time <laughs> so, uh, i took one for the team so you guys yeah. don't have to so i don't <laughs> but honestly for as a star wars fan as a og and i don't even think you need to be an old school star wars fan i think if you want to know anything about star wars and understand where it came from and understand that time a time when there was actually a chance star wars might have been forgotten about which none of us can even imagine now you have to check out uh, a disturbance in the force so uh jeremy adam and kyle thank you all, both uh, all both i'm not very good with numbers thank you all so much for being with us tonight and um and talking to us about this documentary and wishing nothing but the best with it thank you so much thank you thank you thanks yeah bye thanks guys bye. all right i'm gonna hit the end record here and